reading. The first Sunday of Advent, hope. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all day long. Psalm 25, 4 and 5. Jeremiah 33, 14 and 15. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the gracious promise I made to the house of Israel and to the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will make a righteous branch sprout from David's line. He will do what is just and right in the land. 1 Thessalonians 3, 11 through 13. Now, may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus clear the way for us to come to you. May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else, just as ours does for you. May he strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all his holy ones. In the midst of uncertainty, Jeremiah directed Israel's attention to an anticipated time when God would set things right. Paul prayed for the, Thess the Thessalonian church both day and night to fulfill a longing to see and support them so that they would increase and abound in love for one another and for all. Sometimes we, must wait for this fulfillment of a promise. What are you anticipating this season? What promises are you waiting to have fulfilled? Let us pray. All present one, may we find a sense of hope and anticipation in the midst of our current realities. May we not lose faith. In this season of Advent, encourage and strengthen our faith and give us eyes to see you. Amen. Thank you. It is time for the sharing of joys, concerns, and God sightings. I do have a thank you note I want to share with you. Dear Pastor Michelle and the East Canton Messy Church Gang, thank you for the delicious Thanksgiving meal, for spending time with our sojourners, and wow, the quilts. What a blessing it will, they will be to the ladies of the House of Hope. In his love and service, Pastor Angelique. Are there any joys and concerns? The church is gorgeous. Pardon? Yeah. Church looks beautiful. Yes. Thank you, Lily, for the church decorating. It is beautiful. Uh, I'm still taking uh, poinsettia orders. I'm hoping to get the second case, and only five have been uh, spoken for out of this case, and there's eight to a case. Of course, it's a joy, again, that uh, the Canton football team won, but again, I say it's more than just a game. Um, to see the community coming together, not just the Canton community, but looking up in those stands and seeing, you know, representation of all of our county. But then um, when the boys came home yesterday, um, the amount of people in town um, to greet them and, you know, standing out in the cold and stuff, it really is uh, just a, a sign of hope and um, a sign of community. Elaine Shedden also expressed thanks for the Messy Church bag for her great-grandchildren. They were 
really appreciate it, and, and our uh, nieces and nephews also. So thank you. You're welcome. Did you want to say something about the meeting? Oh, yes. Um, we have a envisioning team council meeting scheduled for next Sunday. Um, Al won't be here. And if there's no pressing um, business that needs to be discussed or voted on, I would just like to cancel the December meeting and we will meet in January. I, normally, I don't like doing meetings in December anyway because we all have so many extra things that we're doing. Um, but I didn't want to just cancel it without running that by you um, to see if you would agree to postponing the meeting till January or if you know of something that really needs to be discussed. Um, thoughts? Comments? Are you all right with just saying, let's just take December off? We've got a lot going on. Nope. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. And, and as far as Messy Church, we're up now to, I think we just added a fifth family that's receiving the bags, and, and uh, we really try to pack them with, with activities, with a lesson, with uh, things that the whole family can do. If you know of a family near you that, would, that you are sure would like to receive that, we are happy to loop them in. Um, you know, it's not any more work to do six or seven as it is to do four or five. And so if you would either let Mary Herman know or myself know, uh, we'll be doing something in January. But we kind of did Thanksgiving, Advent, and Christmas with, uh, with the last um, messy church at home bag. But it's a neat ministry and opportunity to reach out. So let us know. I know some people won't agree with me, but it was really pretty when I woke up this morning. <laughs> I enjoy the snow because it takes away all the brown. If there are no others, we'll go to our prayer chorus, Emmanuel, Emmanuel. I will open with prayer. Feel free to lift your voice, and Pastor Michelle will close. Father in heaven, we come here today to worship you, to sing praise, and just gather to be together. Lord, we thank you for the so many blessings that you have given each and every one of us. Lord, we thank you that we were able to share Thanksgiving and that we were able to just focus on being, giving thanks to you. Lord, the beauty of the mountains, with the snow on them, we just come here to thank you and praise you. Lord, we ask that you be with each one of those that were mentioned today. We also ask that you be with those that are traveling, those that are out in the woods hunting. We ask for safe mercies.
God, we lift up to you all those people on our prayer list, our, our leaders at all levels, those who are grieving, those with medical concerns, all those that are in our thoughts, for Jack, for Mary Jane and Marge, for friends and loved ones and members of the community serving in military service. We, we pray for the risers and for all who reach out in love in your name. We pray, Lord, especially for our medical community as they are so stretched with COVID cases. We pray for healing for all those who are hospitalized. We pray for an end to this awful virus. And we pray, Lord, for your grace to lead us and guide us. We're thankful for the ways we're able to reach out and love in, in this community and beyond. We thank you for the gifts that you have given us, the heart for service. And we pray, Lord, that you'll continue to guide us. Empower us, Lord, with the power of your Holy Spirit. And have mercy on us, O oh God, with the blood of Jesus. We pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus the Christ. Amen. I'll read it. I'll read it. Thank you. The gospel is from Luke's gospel, the first chapter. And chapter 1, verses 5 to 25 and 57 to 65. This is the story of the birth of John the Baptist being foretold and then the birth of John the Baptist. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there, oh, I'm sorry, youth, page 1287. Page 1287. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. But they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive, and they were both very old. Once... When Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense, when Zacharias saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zachariah, for your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord God, and he will go before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of righteousness, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord." Zechariah asked the angel, How can I be sure of this? I am an old man, and my wife is well along in years. The angel said to him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and tell you this good news. And now you will be silent 
and not able to speak until the day this happens because you did not believe my words, which will come at their appointed time. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering why he stayed so long in the temple. When he came out, he could not speak to them. They realized he had seen a vision in the temple, for he kept making signs to them, but remained unable to speak. When his time of service was completed, he returned home. After this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant, and for five months she remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days, he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. And then to verse 57, the birth of John the Baptist. When it was time for Elizabeth to have her baby, she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had showed her great mercy, and they shared her joy. On the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, and they were going to name him after his father, Zachariah. But his mother spoke up and said, No, he is to be called John. They said to her, There is no one among your relatives who has that name. Then they made signs to his father to find out what he would like to name the child. He asked for a writing tablet, and to everyone's astonishment, he wrote, his name is John. Immediately, his mouth was open and his tongue set free, and he began to speak, praising God. All the neighbors were filled with awe. Throughout the hill country of Judea, people were talking about all these things. Everyone who heard this wondered about it, asking, What then is this child going to be? For the Lord's hand was with him. This is the word of God. For the people of God, thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Oh, holy God, be present with us as we gather to wrestle and reflect and wonder on these words, on this story of grace and mercy and power. Have mercy on us, O oh God, for it is in your holy name that we make this prayer. Amen. Every week, the last several weeks, I've said to you, now this reminds me of something we were talking about in Bible study. If you think about the response of the people in the community, first to Elizabeth's barrenness, did you notice that when she, when she spoke, she praised God because he'd removed the disgrace from her? And where did that disgrace come from? It, it came from her own lack of fulfillment and her own sense of shame that she was unable to do for her husband what was expected, but it also came from the looks and the comments of the neighbors and, and her quote-unquote friends and her female relatives who judged her. But then when the baby was born, they came and rejoiced with her, and this is, this is definitely most likely the same group of people, you know, kind of like the, the crowd that was cheering for Jesus when he came into the city, and then the crowd that was calling for his crucifixion. Uh, I, I can just see this funny little thread here. And then these same good-hearted, well-meaning people show up at the circumcision, and they are ready to name the child. And I'm thinking, where do they get this? <laughs> Temerity. Where do they think this is for them? And when Elizabeth says, his name is going to be John, they're, oh, no, no, and they go to the father. And, and I think this is interesting. He's the one that can't speak. They can speak, but they make signs to him. It's like if you're around a deaf person or, or someone who doesn't speak English, and you think, if I speak slower and louder, you'll... <laughs> so they're trying to use some kind of sign language to talk to Zachariah to say, what, what do you want the child to be named? It should be Zachariah, right? And Zachariah writes on the tablet, his name is John. You gotta love friends, right? You gotta love the crowd that just is sort of willing to go back and forth and back and forth. I wanted to point out kind of the obvious. This is the first Sunday in the season of Advent. Advent, oddly enough, is not 
the countdown to days of Christmas shopping. But it is a connection for us as Christian people with not only our own longing to see Jesus return. We look at the events in the world, we look at how bad things are, and we think, soon, Lord, soon, won't you come and set things to right? And, and that is a part of the season of Advent. That is a part of the tenor of Advent and the attitude of Advent. But it is also a time when we look back to the longing of ancient Israel for the coming of the Messiah, just as we might think we've waited a long time for, for the second coming. The, the people of Israel waited a long time for the fulfillment of the promises of God. Um, we, we look back, especially, we, we know the story of um, the Israelites enslaved in Egypt um, and God's promise to set them free and God sent Moses to set them free. There, there's a lot of stories in the Old Testament that are considered salvation stories or a part of salvation history. Um, so that's one. But then there, there came a time when, when God used something that we in our time would call logical consequences, you know, logical consequences for us is if you stay out past your curfew, you don't get to go out again for a while. My husband loves to tell a story about my son who missed his curfew and then was grounded for six weeks. And our, the house we rented was on a really big piece of land. Maybe it was only an acre, but it kind of went up this little slight incline to the road behind us. And Jason would ride his bike all the way up to that incline and stop and look and look and ride back to the front of the yard and back to the back of the yard. And that was all he could do for, for those six weeks until the, until the day Roger said, okay, you can go with your friends. Go, go to the carnival. Go have a good time. Your, your time has ended. God had enacted something similar on the, on the people of Israel because they kept turning away from him. They kept worshiping idols. They kept following the kings. The kings were supposed to be spiritual leaders, but most of them were not. And, and they never got rid of their idols. When, when you read the stories in, in the Old Testament around idol worship and idols, the people would put them away. The leaders would occasionally say, put away your idols. And every time I read that, I'm thinking... What do you mean put them away? What about destroy? What about burn? What about get rid of them? And, and the people would forget. I don't know. Do you ever start out to try to do something? You know, maybe at one time you had to quit smoking or go on a diet or, or maybe you decided to give up cussing for Lent. And, and, you know, we set these good intentions. We set New Year's resolutions and we get maybe all the way to the 3rd of January, and we've broken our resolution because we forgot to remember. Finally, because the people kept forgetting to remember their promises, God allowed the people of Israel to be carried off into captivity. Uh, we call that the exile, but it's, you might recognize it more um, by the phrase the Babylonian captivity. The people were in exile in Babylon, and God left them there for a very long time. And this song, this, this mourning, the, 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 um, the mournful sound in that song, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, it is, you know, I appreciate the recording that we use because it's hard not to sing it draggy. But that mournful sound is supposed to come through. It's the sound of people who have forgotten what they did wrong and don't understand why God isn't coming to their rescue. And so they, they sing, O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel that mourns. When are you going to rescue us? And then there's this wonderful voice that says, Rejoice, rejoice. Emmanuel will come to you. Hope, St. Paul says, you don't hope for something you already have. You hope for something as yet to be. And God, speaking through the prophets Isaiah and speaking through the prophets Jeremiah and other prophets, spoke a word of hope to the people. But to be rescued out of, out of exile was a 70-year time frame. And to 
to experience the coming of the Messiah was hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. But that word of hope resided in the people. And so all of that is what we, we try to recall and remember in the celebration of Advent, this, this remembering of their longing, married to our longing, and to the f- story of the fulfillment of God's promise and the birth of Jesus. And it's meant to slow us down. It's kind of like a liturgical, a liturgical roadblock. The purple, the color purple is a stunning contrast to all the other color around us. There was a time in the early centuries of the church when Advent, like Lent, was a season of repentance. And you know, our, our tradition of Christmas gift giving is something that only really began to develop in the mid-19th century, sometime after the Civil War. Um, it, it has seemed to us, this is what we've always done, this is what our families have always done, this is the way it's always been. But if you ever read the Little House on the Prairie books and saw that, that um, Laura was excited to get a tin cup and an orange. That was her big Christmas gift. It kind of grew from there, ballooned from there, maybe exploded from there. But the season event of Advent is meant to be a time of reflection and repentance and prayer and preparation to receive Jesus. But it gets married in with all those other things and all those pressures. You know, it's it's good to buy presents for families and it's good to give to the poor and it's good to make Christmas cookies and and do all the things that happen in the midst of this busy time. But Advent is given to us as a pause. The color purple is the color of repentance. When you think about the birth of Jesus and the events surrounding the birth of Jesus, what What things come to your mind? What parts of the story do you remember? Let's go there. Anybody? When you think about the birth of Jesus, what are the events or the parts of the story that you remember? Or the characters? No room at the end. end. Okay. What else? What comes to your mind when you think about the birth of Jesus, the story of the birth of Jesus? Would you say that again, Arlene? The animals witnessed it. How fitting, right? We've got to talk about that song. Um, There's two songs. One is the friendly beasts. That, that That would be good. Um, what else? I heard another voice. And was it you, Joanne? No? In the stable. Okay. All right, you're good. You're on a roll. Any other characters or events when you think about the birth of Jesus? The angels came. Okay. The star that guided. Okay. Any, any others? The gifts of the Magi. Oh, my favorite. My absolute favorite. Any other events, characters, things that you think about when you think about the birth of Jesus? The shepherds. Okay. You're filling in the nativity. You're filling in the nativity. That's good. Um, Slightly different question. Fill in the blank. When I think about Christmas, I think about your answers might be the same or they might be different. When I think about Christmas, I think about family, love. When I think about Christmas, I think about baby Jesus. Okay. Anything else? My favorite Christmas story. My dad was in the Merchant Marine, and when my parents bought the bar, the Union Villa, he retired 
And for three years, he was retired, and then he went back to work in the winter because the bar was only open April 1st to November 30th, and they spent those winters fixing things up, making improvements, getting, getting rid of the old furniture and some of the old equipment that probably was... I swear there was a dishwasher probably from the 1890s when the place was built. And then there was an old beer cooler that was under the living room where I was sleeping that I thought was going to explode. Uh, so they got rid of all that. When all that work was done, he went back to sea. So there was a, a December, and uh, Dad had a call to go back to sea, and it was like the week before Christmas, but very close to Christmas vacation. And he sailed out of New Jersey. We lived in Massachusetts. So this was probably the best idea I ever had. Mom was getting ready to take Dad somewhere, to the bus station, to the train station. And I said, why don't we just take Dad all the way to New Jersey, and then we can go to Baltimore for Christmas. Instead of being alone in a four-story empty hotel, we could be with family. Less than 45 minutes, we were in the car and on the road, and it was just the best Christmas I remember. It, yes, it would have been better if we'd had Christmas with Dad, but with him and the Merchant Marine, that wasn't what normally happened. The second best thing was being with my mom's brothers and sisters and my cousins in Baltimore and not being alone. It was just great. So when I think about Christmas, sometimes I think that's probably my best Christmas memory out of, out of all my, my childhood and youth. Our memories are important. They're ways they, they connect us. Um, they're, and not only ways they connect us, that where we are from is such a can be such a really big part of who we are. So I was thinking, Arlene, when, when you mentioned Jesus, the animals witnessed Jesus' birth. What a, what a perfect insight in a farming community. I wonder if you lived in a city and had never been around a farm at all, if that would have been your first response. It probably is that something that came to you out of who you are and, and where you are. And I could be assuming a lot, but, but I think that our backgrounds are part of, of who we are, how we relate to each other, and how we relate to God. And they can have a huge influence on us. So I want to say this, and it, this is it, it's not a criticism at all, it's a reality. As Christians, when we talk about the birth of Jesus, when, when we think about Jesus being born, we think, about how he came to save us from our sins. It's true. And all the things that you said, all the things that you connect with are good and realistic and reasonable. But our celebration of Christmas, I want to suggest, is a little bit like cut flowers. Uh, cut flowers are beautiful, but they're cut off from their roots, aren't they? Um, Cut flowers are all about us. It's a wonderful gift. I love getting them. Don't misunderstand. But cut flowers are cut off from their roots. And our celebration of Christmas, our, our reflection on Jesus was born to save me from my sins, cuts us off from the whole history of hundreds and thousands of years of our spiritual brothers and sisters who waited with longing for the coming of the Messiah. And they knew the stories. So when, Luke first, when Luke's first hearers, first congregation, when Luke began to tell the story of Jesus' birth, and he started with talking about uh, when Herod was king of Judea, the people listening are saying, oh yeah, we remember that. Our parents told us about Herod, how bad he was, what a murderer he was, what a selfish, ego-driven person he was. And when they hear about um, Zechariah in the temple offering... Now, this is, this is really, really different for us. You have one pastor at a time. You don't have a hundred pastors and people taking turns and drawing lots to come and bring the message. But in the case of the priests in, in ancient Israel, there were hundreds and hundreds of them, so they were divided up into almost like military uh, segments, and each section would be on duty a particular time. And throughout the number of priests that were there, each individual priest 
would have two opportunities to go into the Holy of Holies to offer the incense. And it was done by lot. I don't know about you, but reading the Old Testament, I've always really struggled with that because it's like, we're not supposed to gamble as Methodists, but there isn't that gambling. But the point of drawing lots was to avoid any kind of political machinations or somebody getting to to go and offer incense more than was their turn or um, arguing over whose turn it was. You drew a lot. It was very clearly your turn. And so when Isaiah went, Isaiah, excuse me, when Zechariah went into the temple because he'd drawn the lot and he offered the incense and he saw that the vision of the angel who said to him, your prayer has been heard, do not be afraid. The first people who were hearing that story probably thought, there's a story like that in Daniel. There's a story like that in Daniel. When Daniel was praying and repenting for himself and the people, and the angel Gabriel came and stood before him and gave him a word from the Lord. You see, they would have had these connections because it was part of their background, their, their religious background, they are learning. And when they heard that Elizabeth, who was old beyond childbearing years and was barren, they would have thought Sarah and Rebecca and Hannah and God acted... And, and I think at this point in the story, there would have been a lot of excitement building, kind of a, a holy fear, but also an enthusiasm because they knew they were going to hear a story about God saving God's people and that long hope fulfilled in their time. I, I did not look up this scripture, but the, somewhere in the Gospels, Jesus talking to the Pharisees or the scribes said, um, you know, there's, you are witness to something that your ancestors longed to see and they never did because they were seeing God in Jesus. That, that communal memory is, is an important part of the story that we celebrate. When we, do, when we celebrate Holy Communion, one of the reasons that I like to use the that long great thanksgiving is the prayer of great thanksgiving specifically talks about God's mighty acts in salvation history with Moses and Abraham and, and Sarah and all the others and God's mighty acts in Jesus and Jesus' ministry and his life and death and resurrection and all of that lifted up together in the story of salvation that we get to celebrate God was at work and, and the hearers of the story, even if the people who were experiencing it, maybe they didn't realize it right away, but God was at work finally fulfilling the hope that they had, that they had been promised. Um, the, other, the other thing that I, that I wanted to mention was um, when they heard that John the Baptist, the child that Zachariah and Elizabeth were going to have, the connection between John the Baptist and Elijah, that would have, that would have been a real bell ringer for them. Uh, and very similarly in Malachi, I think it was in Malachi, talks about Elijah turning the hearts of the people turning the hearts of the people, the parents to the children, and the children to the parents. And it's the same language that is used in reference to, in reference to John the Baptist. Um, that's where we are. It's where we are in the story. It's like we want more. We, we want more. We want to hear about Jesus. We want to hear about the animals. We want to hear about the people that were there and the shepherds. But... All we have on this first Sunday is the very beginning of the story of God beginning to act in very specific ways. Um, have any of you either seen the movie Narnia or read The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe? A few of you, maybe. 
In the story, there is a, a Christ figure who is a lion named Aslan. And in the very beginning of the story makes the comment that the land of Narnia is under the spell of the White Witch. And what that means is that it's always winter and never Christmas. And when Aslan is beginning to move, when God is beginning to move in that scenario, the land starts to thaw. And, and, and the, the, the residents of Narnia begin to realize that that means that Aslan is on the move. With the story of the appearance of the angel Gabriel to Zechariah in the temple and the prophecy, the just about to be fulfilled prophecy of the barrenness of Elizabeth being cast away and Elizabeth having a child and that child who is going to be the forerunner, the one to prepare the way of the Lord. I, I just think that it must have been so exciting for them. And maybe, maybe even... Luke, in talking to the people, after describing the, the birth of John the Baptist, might have said, do you want to know more? And hope the people said, yes, we want to know more. And he would have said, come back next week. Come back next week. I, I, as I was reflecting on this story and, and the words, I was thinking about not only God at work, but, but just the thrill of realizing that God was at work in their midst. And, and here's the thing. God was at work in very ordinary channels. You know, the, they went to the temple. They worshiped. The people stood outside and prayed. Zechariah went in and offered the incense. All of these things were just normal. And, and I wonder, Zechariah was surprised when he entered the Holy of Holies to have this vision of an angel and to hear these words. And that would surprise us too. But isn't there a sense in which when we come to church, when we come to worship, don't we hope to encounter God? And shouldn't we expect to encounter God in some way, not through a burning bush, but maybe just in the ordinary ways of decorated trees and beautiful quilts and, and the gathering of people and the praying of prayers and, and the singing of songs? I wanted to share with you these words from the prophet Isaiah. And think about how long it was from the time that Isaiah wrote these words, spoke these words, until the birth of Jesus. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased the joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at a harvest, as warriors rejoice. At a football game? I just, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressors. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For a child is born for us. To us a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on forevermore. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. And it was in their midst that God began to move to fulfill this text and their hearing for us and for our salvation, but not for us alone. In fulfillment of God's age-old promise and love for all of God's people, God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Amen and amen. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Um, we are going to bless these quilts, these beautiful, gorgeous quilts. And what um, 
in the midst of winter, there'll be Christmas presents for, for little children and a wonderful program and a tremendous display of love and, and material and thread and labor and time. And um, what a privilege what a privilege it is to offer a, a word of prayer on these quilts and on they who will receive them, not only the children, but on their families who might just really need the sign of hope. Would you join me in a spirit of prayer? Loving and gracious God, from the earliest days of your people, from the time of the Exodus, you have gifted and empowered artisans to work in all kinds of material and all kinds of threads and, and all manner of products to use the art and the gifts you've given them for your glory. And so we give thanks to you for the beauty that surrounds us and we ask your blessing on each thread, on each quilt, on each quilt maker and on each child and family who will receive this. May they wrap themselves in these quilts and know themselves to be wrapped in your love in a way that is real and obvious and powerful. We make this prayer, we make this blessing in the name of your Son, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Let's make a plan, friends. I'm not anticipating... I'm not anticipating getting any word of any shutdown, and I'm not planning to ever not come to church on Sunday or to not come to church on Christmas Eve. I'll be here. Okay? Let's just say we're going to worship. I appreciate the masks. I appreciate social distancing. I think we need to do those things. But we're going to worship, so let's stop worrying. Okay? Let's do that. Our um, offertory hymn, To God Be the Glory. is your gift to us and we offer back to you a portion of those blessings. Receive these offerings from the hands of your children, your servants, and multiply them for your use and service to your kingdom. For it is in Jesus' name that we make this prayer. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth I do plan on being here Thursday morning for coffee and conversation, 10 o'clock. I'll bring something to eat. I don't know what, but I'll bring something. And uh, I hope you can join me. Of course, if the weather's really bad, call me or text me, because then we will cancel for another week. But I want to be able to be here. Um, also, for confirmation, I'm not going to keep you very long at all. If you would just stay where you are. Um, I'll come up and, and talk with you for a few minutes and give you an assignment for next week and let you know what we're going to be doing next week. So you don't have to go anywhere. Um, you don't have to move, and I won't keep you five minutes, okay? Our closing song is All the Earth, All Earth is Waiting. And we weren't sure if you knew this or not, so it's a beautiful song, and it talks about that longing for the coming of Jesus. So Lorene's going to play it all the way through once. Okay, and then I'm going to sing it once. I'll sing the first verse and then see if you're ready to join me on the second. Does that sound like a plan? Okay. No. 
Okay. All earth is waiting to see the promised one. And the open for us, the sowing of the Lord. All the world bound and struggling seeks true liberty. It cries out for justice and searches for the Wherever you find yourselves this day, may you walk in God's glory. If you're hunting, may you walk in safety. And may you know God's presence and love is with you and goes before you and will sustain you. And may the blessing of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you this day and remain with you always. Amen. Thank you.